you know, pay attention to your sleep is what I would tell people. And, um, you know, really be mindful of it. You know, keep track of it because going to bed and falling asleep are two different things. ADHD Rewired, episode number 37. This is the show designed for those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. Whether you have ADHD and you want to learn more about it, or you are looking for ways to organize your time, your things, or the many details of life so you can get more done, this show is for you. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank my sponsor. Audible. 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 What? You haven't got your free download yet? Come on, go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free audiobook download. Audible. 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 Trial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Get back to work. ADHD Rewired community, I want to talk to you for just one sec. First, if you're a new listener, I want to welcome you and truly want to thank you for listening. If you've been a regular listener for a while, then you know that ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We're an online community. And one part of this online community is the ADHD Rewired Online Coaching and Accountability Group. This first group, which sold out, started in September and will conclude November 28th, which means I am now planning for the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group version 2.0. If you are interested in being part of the next ADHD Rewired Coaching Group, let me know. Go to erictivers.com slash coaching rewired. That's erictivers.com, which is my name, slash coaching rewired one word if you can't remember the link don't worry the links are always in the abbreviated show notes that are in your podcast player i will have more information in upcoming episodes but i wanted to let you know it's coming now let's get on with the episode the interview that you are about to listen to with roberto olivardia is one that you may want to get your finger ready on the pause button and know where that rewind button is. Roberto drops a a lot of really great uh, kind of value bombs of information where I was learning. I felt like a student uh, talking to to Roberto. So I want to just thank Roberto. And this is an episode we talk a lot about sleep-related issues. Um, we we start talking about sleep apnea and some other things. Then we then we kind of go into some casual conversation. But then we do go back and talk more about sleep. So stay tuned through the whole episode. And I hope you enjoy. Hello, and I am here with Dr. Roberto Alavardia. Oh, I just call Roberto because I met you about five years ago at a Chad conference who I, at first I thought you were pulling my chain when you told me that, you know, you were a doctor. Um, <laughs> Cause when you had your, I think it was your New York Yankees cap on backwards and your ADHD, that ACDC, ACDC ADHD t-shirt on. Yeah. And just, just an animated guy. I'm like, this is a fun person to talk to. <laughs> and, I, and then I ask you, you know, where are you from? And you're like, oh, I'm I'm, I, I'm a, from Boston. You know, I teach at Harvard. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Roberto Olivardia is a clinical instructor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and clinical associate at McLean Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, where he specializes in the treatment of, can you guess it? Attention Deficit Hyperactivity (laughs) Disorder, Body Dysmorphic Disorder, and Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. He also specializes in the treatment of eating disorders in boys and men. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Olivardia is an active researcher. He is the co-author of the Adonis Complex. Am I saying that right? Correct. Uh, Yep. Um, 
The Adonis Complex, a book which details the various manifestations of body image problems in men. He has taught courses at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and Boston College. He has appeared in publications such as Time, GQ, and Rolling Stone. He has been featured on Good Morning America, Extra, CBS, This Morning, CNN, Fox and Friends, I don't know if I'll hold that one against you. And VH1. <laughs> he has spoken <laughs> on numerous radio and webinar shows and presents at many talks and conferences around the country. And now we can add to that list has been featured on ADHD Rewired. Roberto, it's so good to see you and to talk to you. How are you? I'm doing very well, and I'm very happy to be doing this, Eric. It's always uh, it's always a pleasure, and and I remember that conference, and it was a really fun conference. And I was also not clean shaven. I remember that my uh, the next day because I was shaved and I had my suit on and everything. Half the people didn't even recognize me. <laughs> Just so funny. Is this the same person? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny about you know we think about just uh, memorizing uh, people and facial recognition, and it's like. You know, if, if someone changes their shirt, it's like, okay, you're the person in the red shirt, but you're not going to be wearing that red shirt tomorrow, are you? It's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, you have a, a number of different really specialties that, that um, I mean, your your clinical interests are, are pretty vast, uh, um, but also not, you know, I, I, there are people who say they specialize in a hundred different things and you kind of take a pause like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but you really have a good amount of information and knowledge and experience in uh, the areas that I just mentioned in your uh, in your introduction. So yes. what I'm so excited to talk to you about um, one is about sleep. Um, yes. You know, I, I did attend one of your uh, presentations on uh, on sleep issues uh, with ADHD, and uh, you and I both have sleep issues that are I think different. Um, but we know that sleep issues are very very prevalent uh, in in ADHD. Um, and then uh, something that I'd like to also talk to you about is eating disorders, because I haven't even touched on that um, mm. on the show. Um, so where do you want to start? Well, I think with sleep, you know, it, it's uh, I should also say, you know, I, I'm coming not only as a professional in the field, but I have ADHD myself um, and am the poster child of every sleep disorder <laughs> and issue that's out there. Um, I have severe sleep apnea. I, as a kid, was a sleepwalker and a sleep talker. Um, I have uh, had many what's called sleep paralysis episodes, which if people have ever had them, your body is completely paralyzed when you wake up. And sometimes that's coupled with something called a hypnagogic hallucination, which is a pretty scary thing. Um, I have had a sleep study that actually also shows, in addition to diagnosing my sleep apnea, that I have something called the delayed sleep phase syndrome, which basically is where your circadian rhythms are out of whack in a way that instead of 10 p.m. where most bodies are starting when the sun goes down getting tired, uh, my body actually elevates in terms of arousal and and physiology. And at about 2 a.m. is when my brain starts saying it's time to go to bed. And it turns out a lot of people with ADHD have this delayed sleep phase syndrome, because if you had asked me uh, for years what my ideal hours of sleep would be, I would say between 2 a.m. and like 8 or 9 a.m. would be ideal. And that's how I lived my life for many years prior to having children. Um, but children sort of <laughs> change everything. Ha have a way of changing things slightly. Um, <laughs> But sleep is an issue that I don't know anyone with ADHD, actually, that doesn't have some problem or some issue with sleep. And for me, it was very validating to look into the science and look into the research and see that there are a plethora of studies out there that show this highly significant correlation of sleep problems and that there are actually the ADHD brain is actually wired, in a sense, towards having problems with sleep. That, How so? In a, well, one is that uh, what they find is that there is even in our in the biology of there are different neurotransmitters or chemical messengers that we have in our brain. And two of them in particular, dopamine and serotonin, are ones that are highly implicated in ADHD. And for sleep, serotonin in particular um, is one of the neurotransmitters that's involved with sleep. So anytime you have some dysregulation or some issue with a neurotransmitter um, so in one problem, it can 
hit sort of other areas of what the brain, the processes of, of the brain in another area. Um, so that that's definitely one of them. Another is that there's a lot of circadian rhythm abnormalities that have been shown. Uh, the delayed sleep phase syndrome is just one of them. Mm-hmm. For some people with ADHD, I've had patients who've had sleep studies and uh, they don't have sleep apnea. They don't have uh any sort of sleep disorder in that end, but have found that they don't hit REM sleep, for example. It's so random. So we have stage one, two, three, four, Mm -hmm. and then REM sleep, and that's where we dream. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where we are, we feel that sort of refreshing, restorative feeling in the morning. And this patient just wasn't hitting REM sleep and, and it baffled the sleep doctors. Um, part of it also is that a number of people with ADHD have things like bruxism or teeth grinding, restless leg syndrome. What's it called? Um, bruxism? Bruxism. Yeah. So that's, that's the medical term for teeth grinding. Yeah. I've bruxism. never heard that before. Cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good SAT word. Um, and so when you have, you know, if you're grinding your teeth, if you have restless leg syndrome, if you are a sleepwalker, or sleep talker, it's almost as if the ADHD brain can't even fully quiet itself even in sleep that you know your motor activities your body's still kind of going i mean it's hyperactive so to speak even even within sleep um there are genetic research that's starting to look at certain um you know genetic mapping and certain enzymes and there's one enzyme called comt which stands for catecholomethyltransferase uh which is (laughs) which is a a, i love saying that word um basically so cool Ooh, <laughs> mm, thinking. <laughs> there you go. That's a good way to know it. And what it does is COMT actually inactivates um, an enzyme that processes dopamine in the brain. So in other words, your brain is not getting the, the level of dopamine that it needs. And when we sleep, actually, we want to be at sort of some level of um, – of awareness or focus so that if we're too distracted, like if we're not stimulated enough, our minds are going to go everywhere. And that's what is very hard for many people with ADD is to fall asleep. You have to, in a sense, surrender your mind and just focus on falling asleep. And uh, that's very hard for people with ADD to do. Is, so, so the C- Go ahead, go ahead. So the, the COMT, they find that it inactivates certain uh, enzymes that actually process dopamine so that your brain is not getting sufficient levels of dopamine. And we know that already, I mean, the ADD brain is tends to have very low levels of dopamine to begin with. And dopamine is the reward center stimulation neurotransmitter. So if we don't have enough of it, we're always seeking levels of stimulation and pleasure. Mm -hmm. So sleep is a very under aroused state for people with ADD who are then seeking a higher level of stimulation, which is what we don't want. Like that time of night, that time of the day, we're supposed to be, de- you know, destimulating ourselves, not looking for more stimulation. Mm-hmm. And that those are just the biological reasons. I mean, psychologically, I mean, many people with ADD, um, you know, tend to engage in very high stimulating, high sensory uh, activities and behaviors, which are going to arouse anybody and anybody's system and physiology more to make it difficult to go to sleep. And also, you know, and I and probably because of this biology and this hardwired nature, but I also really love the night. Like I love, I have this sort of um, this real kinship with the night. And there is something the, special about it. It is very special. It's no one. I don't have any expectations. Like nobody has any expectations that I'm going to be doing being productive at one in the morning. Mm-hmm. And so I feel just very calm. Um, you know, for the most part, no one's going to be calling me uh, at one in the morning. Um, so I it's really distraction free. And so throughout my entire life, I was I was definitely an all nighter kind of person, high school, college, grad school. Mm-hmm. I did all of my most productive work in the nighttime. And even though I might have had all day to do something, it was so hard to get it done in the day. And then and 10 o'clock hits and I feel this sort of surge of energy and I still have to I work at it. I mean, going to sleep uh, for people who deal with this, it wouldn't be silly. But for people who don't, it sounds silly that I put in a lot of effort to go to sleep every night. Roberto, so do I. So I know that um, over the last, I think, four or five episodes on the podcast, I uh, during my, my closing of it, I update everybody on my sleep goals. 
So my so one of my sleep goals, so I think, is anchoring behaviors. So the things that, that I need to do first in order to follow the sequence of helping me get to bed on time. And yes. so one of the, those is to leave my office and to be able to um, put my, my son to bed um, uh, during the week, at least twice during the week. Because mm-hmm. I went for mm-hmm. like a month where like I didn't really see him at, except for the mornings. Um, and yeah. that sucks. You know, it's like, I, I want to spend, I want to spend time with my son and my wife. Of course. Of course. You know, so it's like, okay, at night I'm looking at the clock and I, I missed that time. And then, so it's like, all right, I'll leave in half an hour. And then it's midnight again. And it's mm-hmm. so I have, and I'm looking at it right here is a Scooby-Doo uh, behavior chart. Cause I, I, just I love like it. To make things fun. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of silly <laughs> and that just, you know, it's like, yeah, cool. So yeah. I'm, I've been tracking my, my sleep and, um, so it's been really, it's been, I'm doing a lot better. Although this week I, with the Chad conference coming up, I have a, a big article that I'm writing for, um, a magazine and I'm like writing kind of, you know, weirds me out. <laughs> I'm a talker, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's, I agree to do this because it's an, a content area that I'm, you know, it's all about apps. So I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, I, I could certainly write about 30 apps. No problem. Right. But I don't like to write. <laughs> so I have like all these big projects going on. And yeah. that revs my brain up, and it makes it hard for me to wind down. So the last, like, I think two or three nights, I've definitely made it home much later than I've wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I put in so much effort, and it's, it's as you were saying, I work really, really hard at getting myself to get home. I've, I'm doing this online group that I have accountability partners specifically for sleep, and I, I participate in it just as much as I am leading it. You know, it's... That's great. So it's... that's great. Yeah, I mean, it's still it's it's a real battle. I mean, I think you know part of it too is that I do produce a lot in the nighttime. You know, it's not that it's unproductive. I mean, mm-hmm. I have written twenty page papers overnight. I've you know written, but it all comes at a consequence. And I think you know, I, having turned forty, you know, once I turned forty, I remember thinking, you know, I really can't be doing this, you know, until like, and, and expect to live to be a hundred, you know, my dad lived to be 90, almost 91. My grandmother lived to be, you know, almost 99. Um, I want to live that long and they lived amazingly healthy lives and, um, they, neither of them had ADHD. (laughs) So I can't say I'm, I'm, I'm more, um, on the maternal side, but, um, I am a lot like my dad in certain ways, but the discipline of things like, you know, regulating your sleep. And I, I remember making a very conscious decision. Like I, you know, I want to see my, my grandchildren and and I want to live this long life because it's come with consequences. I mean, I've had, I remember in college, um, writing my senior honors thesis, which I collected all the data for. And of course it just sat and sat and sat. And I, I wrote this 130 page thesis in three days and it, yeah, it was completely crazy. Um, and and I didn't. Are you I mean, sure this I wasn't like a manic episode? This th- was that's like... what people thought. You know, I I'm sure my professors thought that. And it's no wonder that ADHD and bipolar disorder, which I I treat a lot of patients with bipolar disorder, um, can often be misdiagnosed because it probably looked that way. I mean, I didn't sleep. I mean, when I say three days, I mean continuously three days. And what I learned from that experience is that your brain does very weird things when you haven't slept, when you haven't slept in three days, including hallucinate. I mean, I would literally be by the third day. I remember typing, and my room, uh, my uh, friend who lived next door uh, from me, he would come in, and I had him sort of knocking on my door, making sure I was staying on track. And he said, Roberto, do you realize you're writing complete gibberish? Like you're not even writing like anything (laughs) by day three. And I said, what? And I and this is what's scary is I swear to you that what I was writing made total sense. And I would have these hallucinations of like it's not like I actually saw the mouse, but I would have this sensation that a mouse just ran by. Like it's strange to describe because it's not like I actually saw the mouse, uh-huh. but it's it's as if like, you know, in those cartoons when something runs really fast, you see sort of these lines or this mm-hmm. blur. That's what I thought I saw. And he said, you need to go to sleep. And mind you, this is what the hyperactivity affords me is that I, this isn't even on any caffeine. I didn't drink coffee until I was 32. I mean, so this is all just, this pure adrenaline and hyperactivity. And so I said, okay. And I remember I took a three hour nap and oh my gosh, I woke up 
And it was as if I had, I thought I literally slept for like 12 hours. I mean, my body was so starved for sleep. And I looked at what I wrote in the six hours, you know, prior to that. And it was, it was complete gibberish. I mean, it was scary (laughs) to me. And I thought, wow, like that was sort of the first thing. But of course that didn't, you know, that wasn't enough of a wake up call. Then in grad school, I remember similarly, you know, being sleep deprived for, you know, a while. And, and I was also stressed too, because I was moving from one house to another and I developed shingles. And if anyone has ever had shingles, it is the most painful. Oh um, it is like, I remember when I got it and I it's thought like a belt I you know, chicken pox, right? Basically. Yes. And elderly people are at high risk for it. And apparently even people in their thirties, <laughs> <laughs> if they're not sleeping um, and are stressed out. And I called my doctor and I said, you know, I, I have this rash on my, my stomach and I touch my skin and it literally feels like razor blades ah. on my skin. It is so painful. Like, what is this? And he goes, huh, it sounds like shingles. And I said, shingles like don't people in their 80s get shingles and he said yeah he goes why don't you come in i came in and sure enough it was shingles and basically what shingles are i mean it's more than the adult chicken pox it's imagining your nerve endings completely exposed so i happen to have it on half my stomach and half my back so even wearing a t-shirt like hurt i mean it literally felt like knives like digging in my skin it was the worst and after that i thought oh my gosh i'm going to get sleep i'm going to be so good about my sleep and you know i I was for a couple weeks after and then it just fell back into the pattern and so this is you know when i learn from those experiences it's that it's that our, our brain is not good at remembering the consequence Absolutely. And and I, I mean, as I'm telling you this now about the shingles, I can connect to the pain of it. But the connection that says, therefore, you have to make sure you get to bed, like by a certain, it doesn't because this, the, the other overriding thing is that when I'm uh, sitting at my computer and I'm thinking, oh, okay, I can bang out this article right now, or I can get this, this and this done. And many of us with ADHD, unfortunately don't view sleep as productive Mm -hmm. and i have to tell you that you know with all that i talk about it there is still this 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 that add voice in me that says sleep is a waste of time like you could be doing so much right now you even even if it's leisure even if i could be watching like i'm watching curb your enthusiasm right now and I, i love it and i could be watching another episode why go to sleep and that's still there and i have to acknowledge that that voice is still there although there's so much more of me that understands so logic like the, the psychology of it that's the, the, the exactly yeah. and that's powerful and it's very powerful because although i know everything i mean i i've read it i i know i've experienced the consequences and i think it goes to show for people and particularly you know for parents who might have kids you know are teenagers in particular with adhd they're like why don't they just go to bed at a certain time and i'm telling you as someone who is fully educated about the consequences of sleep deprivation who are mm-hmm. fully educated about how important it is it's still hard because yes. there's a part of me that still says this is a waste of time even though i would never you know for my children I mean, I'm modeling a very different thing. I mean, and, you know, we're very open about our ADHD and and our family and everything. And so I tell my kids it's very important. Sleep is a very important thing. And daddy is not an expert at, you know, practicing it 100 percent. But I'm better than, you know, than I used to do what I I, say, kids, not what I do. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So I don't know. It's sort of like. You know, I remember someone saying, oh, my gosh, that must be so awesome that you could sleep, you know, three hours and be fully functional the next day. And I can be functional, but I think people have to remember there are certain consequences. And I'm also in a job that I absolutely love. Like, I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm very stimulated by it. People are just inherently interesting to me. Now, if you put me in another job, I would be dysfunctional because I would fall asleep easily. Mm-hmm. Like my sleep deprivation would easily like just get me. Um, so you work I with think some very that, challenging clients. And I do. Yes. I, I see, you know, in addition to the things you mentioned, I, mean, I work with um, a number of people with bipolar disorder, people who are suicidal, um, people with you know, various degrees of depression, uh, psychotic disorders, addiction. Um, and, and I really, really love what I do. But I, you know, I'm, I'm coming more and more to this moment of clarity of the sleep is and I've been actually better over the last uh, 
you know, four or five months, I've been, you know, really working at it, but it's hard. It's what have you been hard. doing specifically that's, that's helped you improve? Sure. One thing that I've done that uh, is when I'm on my computer, there are online alarm clocks that um, I didn't even, you know, and it's one of those things that I'm like, why didn't I think of this before? But there are these online alarm clocks that just go off. Um, and, you know, so I'll, I'll set it for like midnight, for example. Now, mm -hmm. you know, mind you, left to my own devices, like two o'clock is probably the time that I would go to sleep and, and wake up at six. I mean, I'm not getting much sleep. And so I'll set the online alarm clock at midnight and or earlier, depending. And it's amazing how even that just going off, it just cues me. It just gives me this like jolt of, OK, I really should be now getting mm -hmm. like in bed. So every minute after that, now it's almost like it's kind of funny to describe. It's almost like I feel like the moments after that are sort of ruined, like any productivity or any <laughs> leisure I would get is like ruined because I know that that alarm went off and I really should be in bed. So I'm like, oh, I might as well just go to bed then, you know, because I'm thinking too much about the fact that I need to be in bed. But that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I've done. Um, another thing is, interestingly, um, even with like I prefer personally when I'm in bed to have lots of like covers and like a heavy comforter on uh -huh. me, but I tend to run very hot. So I don't like the, the, you know, very light clothing. Like I would never, I remember as a kid wearing those God awful flannel, um, the pajamas that you're, Were they your like, feet... like pink bunny ear, ear pajamas, like in the Christmas story. They they basically could be that, but without the bunny ears. And I roasted in those pajamas. And I, I mean, I can't have, I can't be hot, um, or the, the room way. definitely can't be hot. So my bedroom, um, the temperature is brought down. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but I have sort of this heavy comforter, but it's not a hot, like a super hot comforter. It's mm -hmm. just, it's more like just heavy. Mm -hmm. And I like the pressure. And I realize that I need that sort of sensory kind of pressure and it makes it a little bit harder to get up in the morning because I'm so cozy but I that's much easier to deal with because the I don't want to be I don't like being late I'm very um obsessive about time I and being very yeah, punctual I'm, I've kind of gotten to that way I mean, I'm not perfect about it but I am very like I I, I call it a, I'm functionally obsessive because yes of, because if I'm not I'm gonna be late everywhere I go and I'm gonna be in Definitely. Absolutely. And and that's how I am in with a lot of things is that I mean, it's funny because people can misattribute that to uh, being obsessive compulsive, mm -hmm. which I do have some obsessive compulsive traits, but that's not one of them. I think it, it's similar to what you just said. It feels like if I this is a, a strategy that I have to be that mindful of time. So, so speaking of the obsessive compulsive piece, will you um, would you mind sharing a story about when you go to the beach with your kids and how you prepare a snack? You know what I'm oh, referring yes. to? <laughs> I, I'm not sure the if I apple, know. Like the, your... Oh, the apple. Yes, yes. Well, I, you know, I like, I do, it's, it's interesting because I think as someone with ADD, I sometimes really hate routine and I, and I really sort of resist and rebel against structure, but there's a part of me that really loves that kind of routine and structure and systems. And, and so I, um, my son and daughter and I are beach people. Um, my wife, unfortunately is not cause she has lighter skin. So we say her ancestors are from the Mayflower. Mine are definitely for, not from the Mayflower. Um, so we tan and we are on the summer, we go to the beach and we're there at 8 AM and we leave at 8 PM. I mean, we're there the entire day and we love it. And so, um, I, you know, have my system of preparing and I make, you know, certain sandwiches and put, you know, chips in the bag and um, even things like an apple. Um, I don't like to cut up apples ahead of time because I don't like them getting brown. So I bring my little apple slicer. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time I was at the beach and, you know, the apples are out and, you know, we, I wash them, of course, beforehand and I'm slicing them. I bring a little cutting board <laughs> and I slice the apples and this mom came up to me. She says, that is such a great idea. Like I never thought, you know, to bring an apple slicer and apples are a great, you know, refreshing kind of treat, but they do, they get brown. I'm mm -hmm. like, I know, like, that's why I bring my little <laughs> apple slicer. And, um, you know, I bring all the utensils and we get there at eight when it opens because I like the ex literally the exact same spot. It's near the lifeguards. It's a close walk to the bathroom. I can see, you know, my kids and in, in the distance, they're nine and seven. So I don't have to hover over them anymore. Um, 
but of course my eye has to be on them at all times. So I have like my routine and I set up the umbrella. My kids can't go in the water until the sunscreen is on them first. They have to sit for 15 minutes and then they can go into the ocean. (laughs) So, and what I love about that too is, you know, for my kids, especially um, it's important for them to understand that the, this, there's something very comforting about a routine. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, um, I mean, I, I, I rebelled against all of that. Like, I just thought, oh, like, I'm not going to have a nine to five job, which I technically don't. I mean, I, I do work sort of different hours, but, um, you know, I'm never going to have a job that I wear a tie in, which, you know, isn't true because I wear a tie every day and I like it now. now. (laughs) I'm wearing a tie right now. Um, It's funny, you know, one of the reasons I became a social worker is because I view this as a job that I would not need to wear a tie for. (laughs) (laughs) So funny. Um, So I I really wed myself to certain routines. Um, And, you know, it's funny because I... I I think that it could look a lot like um, sort of obsessive compulsive in in ways that, again, I do have some of those traits, but in the ways that I think people think I am, it's more um, coming from the ADD because now I don't have to think about it. That's what I like about the routine Mm -hmm. is that I just it's like I'm a robot when we get ready for the beach. I know I pack this, you know pretty much the same kind of foods and I freeze the water bottles the night before and I use the water bottles as ice packs. And then once I come home, um, we have a system where my son will go into the shower first. And while I'm doing that, I'm emptying out all the play buckets and, you know, the sand shovels and all of that. And then I empty out all the food. I hose down the cooler, put it away. And then all of our bathing suits and towels and all of that we put in a bucket. I immediately put it in the washer and then in the dryer. And then I take I wash out all the sand uh, buckets and everything, and I put everything back in the car, and it's all ready for the next time we have to go. I can like just uh, like almost visualize the, the listeners like the the Richter scale just went off because of all the jaws that just dropped <laughs> and hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it because all I need to do the next time for the beach is just pack the food, like the towels, the bathing suits, this the clothes they change into because at the beach there's these showers that you can just get the sand mm-hmm. off and then we have like a change of clothes and then they come home. All of that I wash dry, I fold, I put it in this bag and I literally just take it out of the car and bam, there it is. So I'm going to use this... Uh... <laughs> This moment right now, because when we think of the beach, we often, you know, maybe go with a good book. So I'm going to take this moment to uh, just break in to thank our sponsor, Audible. So we'll be right back. I went over to Audible to see what would be a good book to recommend for today's episode. So I put in sleep into the search query, and I came up with this book that is actually narrated by Samuel L. Jackson. What book am I talking about? Take a listen. All the kids from daycare are in dreamland. The froggy has made his last leap. Hell no, you can't go to the bathroom. You know where you can go? The f*** to sleep. Go the beep to sleep is available on Audible. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free and kind of funny audiobook download. Now back to our interview. And we are back. So we're back from the beach with your your routine with <laughs> apples, clean bathing suits, and you know. So you develop these routines. You uh, yes. and I think that's these the systems, and it's all about developing systems that work for you. And and you've clearly found you know a lot of systems that work for you. I want to mm-hmm. backtrack a bunch to earlier because there was like I'm I'm holding on to like five thoughts right now. Um, <laughs> so, so you mentioned some kind of. Um, a, a, a certain kind of hallucination oh yes a hypnagogic hallucination right i i, I was like That's... what is that <laughs> so a hip it's very interesting so sleep paralysis is some i did not even know the name for this until i was in graduate school and one of my 
uh, peers in graduate school, this was her uh, dissertation, was studying this. And whenever she started to describe this, and I went, oh my gosh, I have had that my entire life. I remember distinctly the first time I had this, I was at the age of seven. And what it is basically is when we're in REM sleep, our dream, the stage in which we're dreaming, all of our motor functions are actually shut down. So mm -hmm. we're paralyzed when we're dreaming. And one of the theories to that is that Mother Nature does not want us to be acting out our dreams because good, you know, goodness knows what that's going to lead to. <laughs> so all of our motor functions are shut down. Now, when we wake up from a dream, the part of our consciousness that wakes up, wakes up. And then at the same time, our motor functions are now not going to be paralyzed anymore. However, there are a group of people and I am one of them. And I have found a lot of people with ADHD where I am, I can wake up but I am still paralyzed. Like my motor functions are still paralyzed and I am completely awake. Like I am not dreaming. Can you talk? I'm fully conscious. I cannot talk. I can only move my eyes and I can make a sound. And that's what eventually almost pops me out of the paralysis is I make this like, uh, like this sort of guttural sound. And I think what it does is it awakens like it literally like, May, the sensory sound of it is like telling my brain, hello, I'm awake now, like wake me up. But it could be, it's probably like 30 to 40 seconds. It could be maybe as long as a minute, um, but it, it feels like five minutes, but it's probably like 30 to 40 seconds. I'm completely paralyzed. I cannot move. And no matter what you, no matter how hard you try to move, you can't move. And yet, you know, you're awake. And I remember I was seven the first time this happened and it scared me beyond anything i mean i thought oh my gosh like i literally thought am i like paralyzed like did i eat something yesterday i mean i remember it was long enough that i had these thoughts did i eat berries something that i picked in the forest yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which would not have been unusual um did i eat something yesterday that made me paralyzed do i have some disease do i have i mean i was running through all of these things and then all of a sudden it's like your body just like pops out and you're fine. And so I would have this probably like two to three times a year. Um, the last time, though, it's interesting. It's gotten less and less as I've gotten older. I don't know why. But even though now I know what it is, it still is terrifying. Now, for many people who have the sleep paralysis, a number of them, it's accompanied by something called a hypnagogic hallucination. And this is going <laughs> to sound very freaky. Um, what that is, is, and I've had two of these. Um, one of them I distinctly remember when I was at Tufts, uh, where I went to undergraduate, and I, I had a single room, and I woke up, it was the middle of the night from a dream, and totally, again, completely paralyzed. And at the foot of my bed, I kid you not, looked like the outline of a man, almost like in a long black trench coat. I couldn't see his face. It was like, it was clearly the outline of like a person at the foot of my bed. I so, literally so the thought, undertaker showed up at your bed. The, the undertaker <laughs> or the grim reaper showed up at the end of my bed. And I literally thought somebody was in my room and it just like, I mean, it jolted me where I remember literally jumping like off my bed and I ran out of the room and I, called campus security. I'm not kidding. I mean, I was like, I said, there is some man, <laughs> there's some man in my room. And they said, okay. And then I don't know what, this is where I, I'm, it's so funny how your brain works. But even before they got there, I remember thinking, was someone in my room? Like, how could someone be in my room? Like my door was locked because I remembered as I ran out of the room, my door was locked because it was locked from the inside, you know? So how, was there someone in my room? So I opened the door. I mean, this is something that now, like I would, if I, if this was a movie, people would be like saying, don't go back in the room. Um, <laughs> but I did. And I turned on the lights and nobody was there. And then I quickly called campus security and they um, were almost actually in my room. And I said, oh, don't worry about it. It was, you know, I didn't know what to explain to them. I had no idea what it was. So I assumed maybe I was just dreaming, but I knew I wasn't. And then years later, the same thing happened where, um, at again the foot of my bed i saw sort of this like shadow and now what's fascinating about these these hallucinations is this girl that i met in grad school and when i've talked to other people who've had this they've had much more extensive ones but it's interesting that the hallucinations always tend to be very ominous they're never like pleasant like there's something very ominous about these sort of um and you know a lot of people 
mistaken it as either they're dreaming or when professionals hear it, they assume that there's some psychosis or that there's some substances involved, um, none of which were the case. And what's even fa more fascinating is in my postdoc, I did a research fellowship at Harvard Medical School, and one of my colleagues in that fellowship was studying alien people who claimed to be abducted by aliens. And she found that a number of them probably have this sleep paralysis. And for whatever reason, they're confabulating because you do feel this pressure on your chest, like as if somebody is like pressing down on it. But I didn't I knew nobody was pressing down on it, but very short of breath. And there's something about the people who I guess claim to be abducted by aliens personality wise that leads them in that direction. But biologically, they're probably experiencing the sleep paralysis. And it's a very strange thing. There's no rhyme or reason to it. I've you know, when I think about times where I've had those episodes, there's nothing. It's not like I'm particularly stressed out or any. I don't know. It's just I haven't had it in probably like a year. Um, but I used to get them a lot as a kid. Wow. Wow. That's um, it's funky. Yeah. You know, I um, w when you're talking about how you've had these kind of hallucinations, um, when I was in college, uh, I had I. So you talked about you, pulled, you were up for like three days. Yes. So I I um I was up for five days. Once. Oh my goodness! Oh my and goodness! And talk about scary hallucinations. So I was I'm in my in my college room and I, we have like a, a loft. So I'm up on my loft and I just had this this recollection of my my legs are hanging off over the loft, and I my body is actually outside of myself, and it keeps oh weaving goodness. between myself and the clock that was on my wall. Like oh, you know, weird. you know when you see like like the the the, the ghosts in like Scooby Doo or something, where it's like yeah. it's kind of circular motion. Like I'm seeing myself and my clock like, coming off my wall. Like is oh my gosh, crazy. Yeah. And so I, I finally got to sleep, and I had my I had roommates that actually came to work. So this was on a Friday. On Sunday, my roommates came to wake me up to make sure I was still alive. Oh I actually goodness. slept for over 24 hours, like a day and oh, a half. Oh, of course. Oh, my gosh. I can imagine. Your body was in complete deprivation. I couldn't even imagine five days. Yeah. I mean, it was – I had a, a paper that I was due the next day that I was working on it, basically done. You need to just go back to my place and print it off. I go back to my place. I open up the file. The file corrupts. I run back to the library, and it's like a big, like, 10-page paper. And as I said, you know, I'm not really a writer. I've actually recently learned that I may have something called dysgraphia, which was mm -hmm. why it's hard for me to get my thoughts out onto, onto the page. Right. And so I had to rewrite an entire paper. <gasps> oh, my like goodness. Lost, which is why I love the cloud, and I will never save important things to my actual computer anymore. Yeah. Um, just because, like, I need it to be somewhere else where, like, the worst thing can happen and it will still be okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just I just so vividly remember that, and I you know, and I used to pull a lot of all nighters. Uh, and I, I think for me, one of the things that um, uh, really um, shifted my management of ADHD to just go from okay, I'm taking Adderall to okay, I have to really learn what this ADHD thing is and learn strategies to to compensate and right. help myself was when I was in grad school. You know, because when you're when you're in grad school, it's like the amount of of reading and work you have to do is like, oh. I mean. You, it's oh, absurd. Yeah. You're actually not truly expected to be able to do all of it. But I didn't mm -hmm. really know that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just remember like going day after day, getting like one, two hours of sleep uh, a night. And I'd be driving from uh, from where I was living at the time with my parents in Highland Park to uh, downtown Chicago. I went to UIC and nodding off, you know, while driving oh. down. And it's so Ooh. scary. Yeah. And, and so I, you know, I was overwhelmed and having kind of panic attacks and i went into counseling and and uh for it and i um finally read german distraction and it was like oh this is all starting to make sense now you know it's mm -hmm. um so yeah so the, the 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 um sleep issues can really be severe it can be life-threatening really I mean, oh i absolutely. think it was after i talked to you or maybe saw your presentations when i actually got a sleep study um, oh, great. And so I guess the good or bad news was is that they said I slept fine, which I would like to differ because I felt like it was awful. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but they, you know, they said there was no apnea, there was no. Um, um, but you know, it's something that I now really, I, you know, I ask about with all my clients. I ask, do they do you snore? Do you, you know? So looking Definitely. at any of those things, I, I had a client 
that and I really it was through learning about the stuff through you that I really pushed them to get this sleep study and it turns out they, they had the restless leg syndrome the sleep stuff and they got all the sleep stuff resolved oh, and it wonderful. was like magic their ADHD went away which means mm. that it wasn't ADHD it means they had a sleep disorder that absolutely can happen and um, you know and certainly there are people with ADHD who have the sleep problems but I absolutely have seen a number of patients who come in with diagnose ADHD and that's always in my intake for anyone that I meet with I always ask them about their sleep habits and when they had a sleep study they uh, either you know yank their tonsils out or go on the CPAP um, and lo and behold they're doing fine and in my case I mean it was no I mean there's no question I have ADHD if, you know just look at my family tree um, but um, you know my experience with the sleep study was very interesting because I was always a snorer. I mean, my I shared a room with my brother, and he could tell you it, I was like a chainsaw at like nine <laughs> years old, and I was stick thin. Like I mean, so people could not believe that the sound came out of my you know little body at that time. Um, and it wasn't until I had a patient who has ADHD and sleep apnea, and I thought, oh, I should read about sleep apnea. I don't know much about it. So I'm reading about it and I think, okay, I don't, you know, I don't have migraine headaches. I, you know, don't have erectile dysfunction. I'm not severely depressed. I don't have a lot of these sort of symptoms of people who have chronic sleep apnea. I, I wasn't, um, you know, morbidly obese. Um, but I don't ever feel refreshed when I wake. I don't, I didn't understand what that meant when people mm -hmm. talked about, oh, like you wake up, you're so refreshed. I never had that feeling ever. Um, and I thought, why not get a sleep study? You know, it might be fun. Like I almost looked at it more as like a, just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, um, so they hook you up with all these wires. You look like some mutant from, you know, RoboCop. And I told them, I said, I usually go to sleep at two. Like, there's no way I'm going to be able to fall asleep until then. But they put nothing in this room. So it's like so boring, this room, and so unstimulating. And at that time, I did not have like any iPhone or anything like that. Um, so I just laid there and I thought, okay, and I'm not a back sleeper. I always sleep on my right side yeah. from my whole life. So, um, I thought, okay, well, let's see how this goes. So they said, if you have 20 events, now an event is either where you're not breathing, which is called an apnea or a hypopnea is when your oxygen levels are abnormally low. And they said, if you have 20 events, we're going to roll in the CPAP. And the CPAP, is, for people who don't know, is this apparatus. It's a machine that pressurizes air, and you would, you attach it to your nose. Some BiPAPs, it's your nose and your mouth. The one I use is just my nose. And it pressurizes air, so you are guaranteed to get the oxygen that your body just isn't getting. We'll roll that in. Um, and I thought, okay. So I'm like awake. I'm just trying, like, okay, I'm not falling asleep, not falling asleep. Ten minutes later, they wheel somebody, the you know, nurse wheels in the CPAP. And I said, what are you doing? I thought I, I needed to have 20 events. And, and she goes, you've been asleep for three hours. And I said, what? what? <laughs> and I was like, what? What are you talking about? I subjectively thought it was 10 minutes. And I said, are you serious? And she's like, yep. And you've had – and she couldn't tell me the exact number, but she said you've had at least 20. So I thought – Okay, I didn't even really believe it, but I just went with it. They put the CPAP on me. I fell asleep. You wake up at 6 a.m. the next morning. You go home. They tell you it's going to take about six weeks for the doctor to go through all the data. I got a call three days later, and they said, oh, um, actually, the doctor has an opening. Someone had canceled. Do you want to come in? And I thought, oh, you already have the results like ready? And they said, yeah. I said, okay. So I came in. And the doctor said, I actually didn't have an opening. She goes, I needed to get you in here as quickly as possible because you need to be on a CPAP like right now. And I said, what are you talking about? It scared me. She said, you need 20 events in an hour to be diagnosed. And you had 98 in one hour. Oh, my gosh. She goes, and now she says, I've been doing this for 20 something years. The highest number I've ever seen was 68 from a man who weighed 400 pounds and smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. She says, I said, once the technician actually told me the data, I looked at all and I said, we have to bring this person in. And she was shocked, actually, that I was able to do all the things I've been able to do. She goes, <laughs> so it turns out that, and I said, what do I have to do? I mean, do I have to, I'll lose 20 pounds. I'll lose, and she goes, no, she goes, you have a severely deviated septum, which I turns out I did. So I was only getting about 30% oxygen through my nose. Now I had that fix, which helps with my daytime alertness. So even for people with ADD, um, 
it's important, even if you don't have sleep apnea, check if you have a deviated septum, because if you're not breathing well through, even through your nose, that's, you know, cutting oxygen basically to your brain. And she said, your tonsils are enlarged and they're basically touching each other when you're trying to breathe. Ew, so when I was, me. yeah, one <laughs> <to the> other. <laughs> so I was, my whole mouth closed up my uvula, that little punching bag is extra big. My mouth completely closed up and my nose is only getting 30% oxygen. She goes, you, your sleep is equivalent to someone putting a pillow over your face like most of the night. She goes, we have to run. And this is what scared me. She goes, um, because of your age, we're concerned that it has damaged tissue in your heart because your heart basically when people have these apneas it's equivalent to your like interval training when you're yeah. running like you run really 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 fast and then you go slow that's what your heart is doing during this like it's very very bad for the heart um she says we have to run all these cardiac tests and i'm like oh, okay and like at this point i'm like shaking because i'm thinking oh my gosh like so thankfully i have no problem with my heart my heart cleared out fine but she said to me if I continued this way, by the time I was 50, I would have probably died of a massive heart attack because what my heart was already doing was so unhealthy. Um, so she said, you know, you could do all these surgeries, but I, you know, it turns out like my jawline is tipped in a certain way. I, my anatomy is just designed for sleep apnea. <laughs> so I started the CPAP. I hated it for the first month. I, I just thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to. And for me, it wasn't the sort of um, other than the fact that it's so unsexy to be. <laughs> to be using my, my dad has it, and I call it his his like alien mask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You look like this sort of alien, but it's easier. You know, I, I happily married for many years, so I think it's. I think honestly, I feel for people who are single, who you know, it's not it's not a very um, attractive looking thing, but. At the end of the day, oh my gosh, this thing is like a miracle. I call him Pappy now. We're very good friends. Um, me and my machine, he goes with me everywhere. Um, I think the only n nights I have not slept with him is when I've gone on camping trips with my son. And I'm actually looking into getting a battery operated one, which I should get because those nights I feel it when I don't have the CPAP. Um, and I can't even tell you the difference it's made. I mean, I still have ADD and I still can get bored very easily, but it's, it takes a lot longer now. Um, I also lost like 12 pounds in the first month of using it by doing nothing other than just using my CPAP. I didn't wow. change my diet. I didn't change my activity level. Um, because your body holds on to extra body fat when you're sleep deprived. And so things like acid reflux, which I used to have really badly, never had an issue of that since using the CPAP. I mean, again, your body does very strange things when it's not getting adequate, healthy sleep. So I urge everyone who might be listening to this, if you're a bad snorer, that's the biggest indicator. If you are the snorer that people say, man, you're a chainsaw, I can hear you through the walls, get a sleep study because that is, that is the, the biggest like indicator. It can change your life. Oh, it honestly did. I honest, I, I, I mean, I actually know what it is now to have a refreshing restorative sleep. It's, it's just, it really was like, oh my gosh, this is what people were talking about. And, and to know that it's a hundred percent treatable, like the fact that I can use this machine and I'm getting, you know, probably better oxygen levels than most people are because it's pressurized, you know, right. It was weird the first month. And honestly, for me, the biggest issue was more of an executive function one of, oh, my gosh, another thing I have to clean, another thing I have to – every night I have to do this and I have to – it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Can you get like a bunch of tubes just so you can just – you know? Maybe you could. Batch. That's – that's what I do now is I just order, you know, online, you can get the, the equipment. Whereas back then I, you couldn't, you sort of had the same, but, um, yeah. And even cleaning them has become sort of this routine, you know, every Sunday, that's what I do. You know, right after breakfast, I clean the tubes, I put the soak everything in and it's, it's all said and done. Hi, well, Roberto, I know that you, uh, you do have to run. So I want to respect your time. I, uh, I do have to ask you to come back on the show because there's so much more that I wanted to ask you about. Um, Absolutely, you just, I'd love you're, to. You have great stories and you have a lot of information that you know. I I just felt like I just learned a ton. I'm gonna I'm gonna personally go back and listen to this a few times because there's stuff that I want to really learn more about. So I want to I want to thank you for blowing my mind today. Uh, oh, so. <laughs> you're welcome, and thank you for having me. And I'd love to come back. And I'm looking so forward to seeing you uh, just in a, a few days, like in a week. Yeah, in, that's in, right. I'll in my neck of the woods Thursday. in the Chicago area. And this that's right. this will actually be out um, uh, on Monday. 
So, you know, people might hear this, and then if they're going to the Chad conference, they can say, oh, you're you're Roberto. <laughs> yep, yeah, come by. I'll be talking this year um, about ADHD eating, mindfulness, and weight regulation. And I'm actually co-presenting with our good friend Mark Burton, who's a developmental pediatrician mm -hmm. who does a lot of work around mindfulness. Yes. So both of us are doing um, a talk together, which will be really fun. That's excellent. Any uh, last words and let us know how we can reach you. Well, I'm probably one of the few people in the world that don't have a website or a Facebook page, uh, but I do welcome emails. And my email is Roberto, R-O-B-E-R-T-O, -E underscore Olivardia, which is O-L-I-V as in Victor, A-R-D as in Daniel, I-A, at H-M-S, as in Harry, Mary, Sally, dot Harvard, dot E-D-U. And by this I point, everyone you. is hearing wah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I will have the link to his email yeah, address in the show notes. Probably want to it out somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, Roberto underscore something or another, the link will be in the show notes. We'll even get it linked right in the podcast app. So just open it up and you can get that link and reach out to him. Um, and any, any final words? Um, just, uh, you know, pay attention to your sleep is what I would tell people and, um, you know, really be mindful of it, you know, keep track of it, sometimes even just writing it down um, and actually seeing, I think a lot of people with ADHD might overestimate how much time they sleep and when they actually write it down. And when I say sleep, not when you go to bed, because going to bed and falling asleep are two different things. Um, and for those of us with ADHD, there can be a wide disparity between mm -hmm. the time to go to bed yeah, and actually I, I go think asleep. it's important to not trust your own judgment and use technology, whether it's like a Fitbit or a, a, a app like Sleep Cycle for the iPhone. That's what I use. Um, yep. it's, it's, it gives you great, great feedback. 100%. Absolutely. Well, Roberto, thank you so much. And I look okay. forward to seeing you next week. I will see you next week, Eric. Right. Take care. All right. Yep, take bye care. Bye-bye. Well, ADHD Rewired Community as always, I want to thank you for listening and for leaving those five-star ratings and reviews. I know I say it every week, and every week it is still true. Those ratings and reviews are truly helpful. This week, I want to throw out some love to Stitcher. I actually didn't realize that there were a bunch of reviews that people had left, and I, for some reason, didn't know it. I guess I couldn't figure out where to find them. Hmm. So, the one I want to read is from Erin, and... She, I think it's she, says, I've listened to quite a few podcasts regarding ADD and I've read even more, and none have made me feel as comfortable and at peace with myself as yours. She goes on to say, thank you for helping me feel a multi multitude of legitimizing feelings such as peace and hope. I look forward to hearing you every Monday. Well, I look forward to, to you hearing this podcast every Monday. Thank you so much for that review. Um, you can go on to Stitcher or on to iTunes and leave those ratings and reviews. That's how people find this podcast. Do you have a story you want to share about your ADHD? You can go to my website, ADHDrewired.com, click on the podcast tab, and then click the yellow Be a Guest bar. Are you looking for a coach? Schedule a free 20-minute consultation with me. It's super easy. Just go to ericktivers.com and click the blue request an appointment bar we are on facebook like our page and submit your request to join our free community it might take up to a week until i respond and don't forget to check your other inbox because i need to hear back from you before i accept your um, request for the group the 2014 Chad Conference is this week. If you are listening before November 13th, 2014, and you are going to the conference, come and say hi. I will be doing some recording at the conference, and who knows, maybe I can do an interview with you. If you're listening to this after the conference, audio recordings of all the sessions will be available for purchase through the Chad website at chadd.org. I am not an affiliate um, with that, but I think it's something that is definitely worthwhile checking out. If you do live in the Northern Illinois area, you are invited to the Northern Illinois chapter of Chad. This is the Chad group that I am the volunteer coordinator for. We meet on the third Monday of every month in Grays Lake. 
or on Facebook and on meetup.com. Or just check the show notes for a link. All right, it's personal accountability time about my own sleep goals. Now, I have to either make it home tonight or tomorrow by 7.45, um, because that's that's been my goal to do that twice a week. Now, the last few days, I have definitely worked and stayed up later than I've wanted to with the Chad conference coming up and some other big things that I have working on. I have, uh, my, my sleep has, has taken a, a, maybe one step backwards. So I, uh, I've actually called a couple friends and I'm using an accountability partner today to help me get home and get to bed on time. And I will update you next week. To the members of the ADHD Rewired Online Coaching and Accountability Group, I just want to thank you for the last two months and want to give you a, and want to give Diane a huge kudos for putting together a fantastic presentation about the lessons that you've learned. I am so looking forward to this last month. Would you like to be a part of the next ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group? coaching version 2.0 let me know by going to erictivers.com slash coaching rewired again that's erictivers.com slash coaching rewired so i asked roberto what is the one thing that you are really hoping to see at this year's chat conference he said the outline of a man almost like in a long black trench coat at the foot of my bed This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening, and until next time.